Good morning, everybody. And you're thinking, but Pastor Brent, I'm not really watching this in the morning. Well, trust Hannah and I. It is, um, it's morning at least. We're not sure about the good morning yet, but it's morning at least. We are recording this a little earlier than normal, at least as it relates to uh, in the day. So if we don't seem as perky as normal, that's why. I do have a cup of coffee to my left, and so I, I plan to at least dip into that once or twice. Hannah has her mug up, and Hannah and I have matching mugs other than the colors. This is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, we have matching mugs other than the colors, which means that they're not matching mugs, really. But they, yeah, they're, they're good expensive ones, I guess what we're saying, and they actually keep the coffee hot. Um, we're going to get going. We're going to pray. A uh, number of things that you could pray for. The church still needs staffing. We are um, still slowly working through the interest, and we are still praying about that, having the right people. Um, we have some uh, people that are connected to the church that are in the hospital dealing with some pretty serious health injuries. We have some people at home dealing with some health stuff. There continues to be mental health issues, and so we want to remember those people in prayer as well. Um, we have some people looking for jobs, and of course, the world's a mess. Uh, all kinds of things going on in the Middle East, and crazy leaders, and this, that, and the other thing. So let's, let's just pray. Serious stuff. Father, today, as we begin our day here at the church, and others begin their day at work, we just pray, God, that you would just be with us all. Lord, help us just to be led of the Holy Spirit this day, just to walk in the fullness of your word, and just to sense, um, Lord, the the divine guidance of God. Uh, Lord, people will be watching this at different times of the day, and whatever time of the day that is, we just pray your richest blessing on them as well, and your guidance and presence in their life as well. We think about the big things that are going on in the world, in the Middle East, and the Ukraine, and things like that, where... There's all war and all kinds of uncertainty, possibility of war spreading. Lord, there's elections coming up. There's concerns just about everywhere as we think about things politically. And so once again, we look to you, you know, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We don't look to human beings. We're not looking for a person, a man or a woman to fix this. But we do pray that there are men and women of God that care about you and care about the world in which we live in. And Lord, that would just be obedient to your direction and that you would raise up those that you want to be raised up and you would bring down those you want to bring down, just like you did in the days of Pharaoh, just like you did in the days of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Lord, we know that ultimately you are Lord over everything and everyone, and we take great comfort in that. Pray today, God, for those that are just continuing to deal with mental health issues, Lord, the struggles that they are facing. Lord, we, we pray for them. We, we don't judge them. We realize that for some people, the struggles are, are, are terrible, are powerful, are awful. And we just pray, God, that uh, you would help them just to persevere, uh, Lord, sometimes minute by minute, but that you would just be with them and with their families. We pray, God, for those that are in hospital, that you would minister to them and bring healing to them, body, soul, mind, and spirit. We pray for those that are at home, that are recovering, Lord, dealing with uh, some personal stuff that you would just be with them and their families as well. Uh, Bring answers to them and and help them, Lord, in the struggles that they are facing. For those that are in need of employment or better employment, we just pray, God, that you would just provide for them as well. Um, You'll take care of them. You know their needs. Uh, You have the right place at the right time, and we just pray, God, that you would just help them with that. And as we think about that for others, we think about our own staffing needs here at the church and that, God, you would bring two godly people our way, uh, perhaps a God with families, and that you would just help us to just uh, continue to knit the team together here and and to build and to move forward. And we just thank you for your word, God. Tonight we begin a, a Bible study. Wednesday night we begin a Bible study about how to study the Bible. And we pray your blessing on that as well and the people that will be attending. And we just pray your blessing on this Bible study as we actually study 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So be with us one and all, we pray. Help us today. Give us your grace today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So take your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
<clears throat> Pardon the, uh, the early morning cough. <laughs> and uh, you're going to get a sheet of paper that looks a little bit like this. And it's going to have all kinds of interesting stuff on it. And um, you're going to notice that it starts in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I think because I got an early morning cough, <clears throat> it's time to wash it down with our, uh, our coffee. It's, it's not a Coca-Cola, but I can't do Coca-Cola at, uh, at 5 to 9 in the morning. Can't do that. Too early for me. I used to, uh, story time, when I was um, a summer student and working at the mining company in Sudbury, we, uh, we worked with a guy, massive man, big guy. He was as thick as he was tall. And uh, he would bring two Pepsis with him. Always Pepsis, never Cokes. But he would bring two Pepsis with him in his lunch pail. And our, our cage, that's what they call the elevator that brought you down into the ground. Our cage would go down about <clears throat> 10 after 6 in the morning. And we'd get off at our level, which was usually, you know, around 44, 46, 4,800 feet into the earth. We'd get off and we'd go to the lunchroom, we'd put our lunch pail there, and then we'd go to our work areas. But before we go to our work areas, this guy would always crack one of the Pepsis open, and he would drink a Pepsi Cola every morning at about 20 after 6 in the morning. <laughs> And I remember just watching him do that, you know, because it's pretty sweet. I, would re I, I just remember as a student watching him do that, going like, oh, my goodness, how can you drink a, a cold Pepsi at 20 after 6 in the morning? And without fail, we worked with that guy for 20 weeks. Without fail, every Monday to Friday, he would crack a Pepsi first thing, save the second one for lunch at 11 o'clock, and that was routine. Uh, I can't do that. I can't do a cold drink in the morning. Maybe an apple juice or an orange juice, but, but that's it. But yeah, yeah, that's uh, tough. Any, any strange drinking habits that you have, folks? Can't drink hot drinks, can't drink cold drinks, certain times of the day. Generally speaking, I won't have a soda or a pop uh, until it's after 12 o'clock noon. I just, I got this rule that you don't drink anything like that before noon. Um, that might change when we're on holidays if we've been up really, really early, but yeah, no, usually that's, I got a rule there, hard and fast. That stuff happens after uh, afternoon. If you've got any weird drinking habits, and I don't mean alcohol, by the way, if you've got any weird drinking habits, pastor at EssexGospel.com. I'm sure Hannah will pick up on this and we'll see a funny uh, shot pretty soon. Julian! 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. You know, brothers and sisters, Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So <clears throat> let's deal with 1 Thessalonians. Short form for Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 2. <clears throat> you'll see in your notes, you'll see in your notes that <clears throat> Paul is, is basically just, it's almost like 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the introduction, uh, or still part of the introduction. And, and it could very well be, right? Because back when these letters were written, there were no chapters or verses. Hey, you want to know when chapters and verses got added uh, to the Bible? If you come to How to Study the Bible, Wednesday nights at 6.30, that's going to be one of the questions that uh, I will answer. I'm going right back to the basics about how to study this good book, and that's one of the questions we're going to, get, uh, we're going to answer because that hasn't been around forever, chapters and verses. It was just a letter. This was just a letter. 
So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, seems to be like it's part of the, the introduction. And the first thing he does is he reminds them about their time in Philippi. Now remember, remember the story here from Acts 16 and 17. Paul gets called over to Macedonia. He has the vision. Come over and help us. The, the first place he goes is, is uh, Philippi. And they have a really hard time in Philippi. I mean, they get, they get tossed in jail and, you know, they get abused and, and it's really, really horrible in Philippi. And again, I dealt with this in the intro on very, very first pay, uh, very first this, uh, study, but you can read about that again, in first, pardon me, in Acts chapter 16. And so this is Acts 16. They get abused. And then they make their way to Thessalonica, you know, which is a little further down. And I'm always messing up the spelling on this. Then they go to Thessalonica, where they are now. And Paul preaches there three Sabbaths. So, Paul is reminding the Thessalonians, uh, yeah, the Thessalonians, you know, about his how he got there and how he began his ministry at Thessalonica. And by doing that, you will see in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 and 2, he reminds them of all of the suffering that they dealt with Philipp at Philippi. But undeterred, even though they suffered a lot, undeterred, they continued on the ministry of the gospel um, to Thessalonica. So he says this, verse 2, We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, and they were. But nonetheless, with the help of God, it says, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So then they go to Thessalonica. But there's strong opposition, right, in Thessalonica as well. And you read that as you move on to, like, Acts 17. There's strong opposition there as well. Paul preaches for three Sabbaths, but one of the reasons why he only preaches for three Sabbaths, likely only sticks around for about three weeks, is because there's strong opposition there. They sign a peace bond and they move on, uh, you know, eventually where they're going to get to, to Berea. But if you, again, go back to, to where all of this starts in the book of Acts, you will see this in Acts chapter 17, and then in and around verse 7, 8, and 9, Paul and his friends sign the peace bond, and they, they leave, right? The whole idea of signing a peace bond is there's been a disruption. If you sign the peace bond and follow the peace bond and leave the town, there will be no further problem. But if you sign a peace bond, in other words, that you promise to keep the peace, and stick around and stir things up again, then you're going to spend some jail time. So Paul and his friends signed the peace bond. Jason may have been a part of that as well, and they move on. So even though they were only there for three Sabbaths, Paul says this uh, in verse 2, that, uh, you know, we dared to tell you the gospel in the face of strong opposition. And at the beginning of this, in verse 1, he says, you know what, even though we had strong opposition, you know, our ministry was effective. And it's worded this way, that our visit to you was not without results, right? Not without results. Our ministries should have results. Sometimes in, in a church culture, there's this attitude, there's this attitude of, you know, we don't expect too much. We're just ordinary people, modestly gifted, giving a little bit of time to the work of the Lord. So, so don't expect too much. But then, church people also know this, you're connected to other Christians and other Christians go to other churches and you hear about other Christians and other churches doing some pretty amazing things. And you ask yourself, well, how come they're doing such great things and we don't seem to be doing great things? Like, what's, what's up with that? 
Well, you, you don't want to take um, a small town, smaller church mentality to your ministry. You know, regardless of whether your church is in a town of a million people or a thousand people, whether your church has 50 people or 500 people, you should expect God to be working in you and in your church body and that it should be effective ministry. It should bear fruit. It should have results. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Paul was only in Thessalonica with his team, but they were only there for three weeks. And this is what happens in three weeks. So I'm going to take you back to Acts 17, and I know we read it, but nonetheless, that was, that was several weeks ago. Look what happens in, in, in Paul's ministry with his friends in Acts 17. It says this in verse 4, Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, in other words, Gentiles who had already converted to Judaism, and quite a few prominent women. All of that in Acts 17, verse 4. In other words, it doesn't necessarily take forever to have effective results-driven ministry. If you're committed to it, Paul experienced, Paul and Silas and their friends experienced all kinds of opposition, but they, they, they pushed through, right? They, they persevered, they, they overcame, despite great personal sacrifice and pain. But God was working, they were going to stay committed to it, they weren't going to flee. Remember John Mark on Paul's first missionary trip? With Barnabas, things got tough. John Mark took off, right? That gets fixed later, but not until later. John Mark took off because, you know, sometimes when the going gets tough, you know, the weak get going. And so there was opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ by Jews and by Gentiles. I mean, that was just part of, you know, the journey. That was just a, a piece of what was going to happen. Anytime you're going to preach the gospel, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be spiritual opposition. The spiritual opposition might come through flesh and blood, but ultimately it's centered in Satan. So you and I should not be surprised that when we try to share the gospel that there's opposition. Nonetheless, you and I must learn to persevere. And even, at, even just little old us in our little old church we should expect results. If we're willing to do the hard work, if we're willing to do the heavy lifting, if we're willing to persevere, there will be fruit. It will be effective ministry. And um, as long as we keep that, you know, as our, our, our priority, we're going to be fine as individuals and we're going to be fine as a church. Keep on doing the work even when the work sometimes is tough. So, with the help of our God, we dare to tell you the gospel, even in the face of strong opposition. Strong opposition. Let me just put that over here. So, even though there was strong opposition, they still had results. They had very effective ministry, but it was not without personal cost. Absolutely, it was with personal cost. And then he's going to go on into two areas. He's going to talk about the first one I'm going to deal with kind of as a negative. How not to conduct yourself when you're, you know, sharing the gospel, when you're living your life out in front of your, your co-workers and your family and friends that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then I'm going to, after I deal with it from kind of the negative point of view, and you'll see this on, on the PowerPoint and in your notes, I'm going to deal from a, from the positive point of view, the, the qualities, the characteristics that we ought to have. And so you will see that on your sheet here as you follow along in your notes or you just follow along on the PowerPoint that Hannah will put up there for you from time to time. Verse 3 then, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please uh, people, but God who tests our heart. You know, 
We never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, um, and, yeah, let me just stop, stop, stop there at, uh, at the end of verse 6. So Paul talks about the negative stuff, um, and I'm sure it's a contrast to those that even early on in, in, in church growth and church development in the first century, that there were people out there not always being honorable with the gospel message. So Paul uses these, these criteria to say to the Thessalonian church, look, we're not like others. The, even though Christianity is new, followers of the way is new, there have always been other groups of religious zealots trying to proselytize, trying to win over people of other faiths or no faith. So Jews trying to convert Gentiles to follow Judaism in order to be saved. That's alive and well. There were all kinds of different philosophical beliefs. There were different temples that people could worship at. And people were, you know, often, you know, adopting a new faith or a new God or a new idol. So that was going on all of the time, even before Christianity came onto the scene. But now Paul, Silas, and his friends are out there sharing the gospel. There's probably others out in certain towns and villages sharing the gospel. And he just wants to remind the church of Thessalonica and remind us today that there are certain things that we just cannot do, and then there are certain characteristics that we must have. So let's look at these as we work from, you know, verses 3 to 6. First of all, Paul says... Um, our, our motives in verse 3 are absolutely pure. Not only are they pure, but they do not spring from air. So, for the appeal we make, the appeal meaning presenting Jesus Christ, for the appeal we make does not spring from air, right? From air. Now, I'm going to rant here for the next little while, again, because I'm not seeing the response that I, I think I need to see, folks. All right. There are a lot of people out there today teaching apparently the Bible or teaching some version of Christianity or some version of spirituality that is just wrong, 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 wrong. Folks, for those of you that have the spare time to listen to podcasts or watch YouTube videos, whether it's while you're driving in your car or you're on your bike or you're going for a walk or you're just sitting out on your back deck listening to these things. M make sure the people that you are listening to are solid, 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 solid Christians. And that when you are listening to these people, you hear the Bible and Bible verses and Bible passages being talked about and handled wisely and accurately all of the time. If there's too much time between Scripture verses or the Bible being given accurately, then the preacher is just telling stories and he or she is not preaching or teaching the gospel perhaps the way it ought to be taught. So, you have to be aware of that. Now, this means scrutiny on your part because I can't be there for you all the time or even some of the time. So, you need to just be sure about these people that they are solid Christians. Now, you can do a Google search on that, and anytime you do a Google search, you will find, and I've said this before, you will find positives and negatives about the different preachers and teachers. So you have to do enough digging to make sure that the right people are saying the right thing about these preachers and teachers, and that if they're saying something negative about them, that also comes from people that you know are trustworthy and solid. If there's a lot of negative stuff out there about them that they teach another gospel, prosperity gospel, or, you know, name it and claim it gospel, 
or they're just full of stories. You know, God took me to heaven. God took me here. God took me there. God did this. God did that. And there's, there's, and there's little Bible to back any of that, or sometimes no Bible. You need to flee from those people. Those people are ravenous wolves, and you are going to get devoured by them. Even if they're not asking you for money, you're going to get devoured by their false doctrine. The other thing that happens, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 2 Tim, 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. This generation knows the ability to gather around themselves people saying what your itching ears want to hear, what my itching ears want to hear. <clears throat> this has been pandemic-like since COVID. Since COVID, there is this train of thought now, a uh, couple of things, that nobody in authority can be trusted. Nobody. Everybody's up to something. The companies are up to something. The government's up to something. Everybody's up to something. You know what? Again, so get a case of water, a, can of, a case of beans, get your gun and dig a hole in your basement and, and just hang in there until Jesus comes, right? Because the whole world is crazy. Now, I will admit with you, there's a lot of crazy stuff going in the world. But I would also ask you not to abandon the world just yet. The Bible tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And until the, until the rapture happens, until we're caught up to meet Jesus in the air, we need to be present here, sharing the gospel, being salt, being light, making sure the word of God is taught to our kids, to our grandkids, to our great grandkids, to our friends and to our neighbors and to our coworkers. We need to be present here, not chasing all of the crazy conspiracy stuff. <clears throat> Look, if all the conspiracy stuff is going on, you and I aren't going to stop it. If that's part of the beginning of birth pains, Matthew 24, for the world is like going over the edge, you and I are not going to stop it. Jesus isn't asking us to stop that. Jesus isn't even asking us to make other people aware of that. Jesus is asking us to stay focused on Him, stay focused on the gospel, preach the good news, point people to the truth, which is the Bible, right? The truth isn't the truth because it comes from a certain individual's mouth. There's a famous person here, or there's a famous person there, or there's someone getting notoriety here, or somebody getting notoriety there, or somebody's got a podcast here, or somebody's got a podcast there. Look, folks, any moron can get a podcast. Any idiot can be on YouTube. I'm on YouTube. Any idiot can be on YouTube. That doesn't validate people. What validates people when we're talking about Christians is what they teach that they teach the Bible and they teach it appropriately. So be very, very careful of the podcasts and the YouTube and, and people that are, are prophesying this and prophesying that and saying this and saying that. There are lunatics out there coming across as prophets and prophetesses of God and they're out to lunch and they're nuts and everything else. And the reason why some of us listen to them is because we've fallen into the trap of 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 to 4. We've bought into a, 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 a way of thinking about conspiracy and anti-authority and anti-government. We bought into the thinking, you know, that, that our inheritance is here on earth. So God's going to make all of us rich. You know, that the kingdom is going to be here. There's not a kingdom to come called the millennium after Jesus, you know, uh, you know, um, takes us to be with him. They, their, their teaching really is about the kingdom is here and the kingdom is now. You possess it now and you're going to get all of the benefits of all of the sinners now. That's not biblical. Anybody that uses verses in the Bible is taking them out of context. The kingdom to come, you know, Jesus was asked this in Acts 1. Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? <clears throat> Jesus said, look, those, those are dates for the Father, right? Go back and read Acts chapter 1, verses 1, uh, verses 1 to 8. Those, those things aren't for me to talk to you about now. Instead, be filled with power and go preach the gospel. Go be witnesses somewhere. Don't worry about that now. The Bible does teach us that Jesus is going to set up a kingdom, a millennial kingdom. Millennial means a thousand years. There's going to be a thousand years. But that ain't now 
That's after Jesus has raptured the church. It's after the tribulation and Jesus is going to set up his thousand-year kingdom. That's down the road. A lot of people that call themselves Christians now are teaching that we're going to get the kingdom here and now. And that's not biblical. That's error. That's heresy. That's wrong teaching. And I don't care who teaches it and how popular they are and how many followers they got and how many listeners they got. I don't care. That's just not biblical. So quit chasing that stuff. Folks, get into the Word more. Instead of listening to all of those different voices, cut back on that, especially the bad ones. Cut back on that and take some of that time to read and study your own Bible, right? Do that. Get a, get a good commentary or a good guide to help you with some of the tougher things. Read and study your Bible. I mean, I listened to a podcast recently where this guy's supposed to be, you know, like some prophet. And I mean, he told story after story after story. And I, and I, like the stories were just ludicrous. But what I also noticed was in this time that I listened to him, I hardly heard him reference the Bible, right? Story after story. There's a big shot in Texas that's got an airplane. And he'll talk and talk and talk and share all kinds of stories about how God spoke to him and God showed him this and God showed him that. And absolutely, he's as wealthy as all get up. And he's wealthy off the backs of blue-collar people. But he's built himself a nice nest, right? His kingdom has certainly come now. But you hardly ever hear him handle the scriptures. It's story after story after story in a sermon. And then when he does teach... It's always with the, you know, you're going to have your kingdom now. You're going to be rich now. You're, you know, you're almost never going to die because, you, you know, you can't get sick. You can't get this. You can't get anything. Like, that's not scriptural. But we listen to these people because they're saying things what our itching ears want to hear. We are the ones that are driving what we are listening to. We can turn them off if we want to, but we don't want to. Why? because it appeals to our itching ears. And the Bible tells us that that's, again, another sign of the end of times, is where Christians don't want to listen to sound doctrine anymore. They don't want to study the Bible anymore. They want to search on YouTube, or they want to search on their podcast. They're popular gals and guys that say the things that they like to hear. They don't listen with it with any scrutiny. They just listen and they go, yep, 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 I agree with that, I agree with that, I agree with that. Why do you agree with it all? Because that's what you want to hear. The Bible says there is going to come a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but instead to suit their own purposes will what? Will do all of these things. Let me take you to the Scripture verses. I'm the guy spouting about the Scripture verses. Look what it says here. Um, verse 2 of 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. We are seeing that epidemically these days. Turning aside to myths. So all, that's just another way of saying all kinds of crazy stuff and crazy teaching. There's never been a time where that can happen like today, like 2024, right? Because we got the podcast, we got the YouTube, we've got all the TV stuff, all the cable stuff, all the satellite stuff. And it can be a blessing. But you have the responsibility to listen to solid men and solid women of God teaching the Bible the way it ought to be taught. And if it ain't, you ought to be turning it off. And let me just remind you, and you ought to be studying this. Let me take you to 2 Timothy 2.15. 2, Again, what the Bible says, 2.15. Do your best. Do your best. None of us are perfect, right? I'm not perfect, not even close. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles who correctly handles the word of truth. There is a way that this word is correctly handled, correctly uh, taught, understood, exegeted, big word. And there are certainly more ways, you know, than a thousand to incorrectly handle it. Your responsibility, my responsibility, 
is to make sure that we correctly handle the word of truth. Because if we don't correctly handle the word of truth, we're going to go to air. We're going to chase things that we ought not to be chasing. We're going to be thinking things that we ought not to be thinking. We're going to be living in ways that we ought not to be doing, right? One of the reasons why I'm teaching beginning tonight, Wednesday night, 6.30, the Bible study, how to study the Bible. Not how to do a Bible study, how to study the Bible. Why? Because it's got different books, different times, different literatures. Prophecy isn't understood the same way as poetry. Poetry is not the same way understood as history, right? Paul's teaching isn't to be understood the same way as the book of Ecclesiastes. We ought to know these things because if you don't, you can't correctly handle the word of truth. So if you're interested in correctly handling it and you're like, you know what, I'm really not sure how to study the Bible well for myself, I've been really trusting other voices to teach me, then this is a good time for you to start. 6.30 here at the church. Look forward to having you. Look what it says, verse 16. 2 Timothy 2, verse 16. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Oh my goodness, Paul, thank you. The false teaching today is spreading like gangrene. It spreads from, from healthy tissue you know, to healthy tissue, and then it just eats away at the flesh, and it just, like, it just runs up your leg or runs up your arm, and it rots and kills everything until it will poison your whole body, right? You just folks, you got to read these passages, right? You got to read these passages. You got to put that into the context here of, of 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. And, and understand just the importance of this, right? Just the importance. Did not spring from air. Air is everywhere. E-R-R-O-R -R -R is everywhere these days. But also, there's really good teaching out there these days. But quit chasing the cornflakes. Get some fiber. Get some good old heart strength Cheerios. Quit chasing the folks, please. Please quit listening and clicking on everything that your safe friends and relatives are listening to and clicking on it because they got a charge from it. If it's not the solid word of God, please run from it. I believe, I believe that we are just in perilous, perilous days when it comes to a mishandling of the Word of God or not knowing the Word of God and chasing after things, I am afraid that our Christian churches are becoming more political than they are religious. They are becoming more dogmatic than they are becoming spiritual. That we are becoming more hateful and more spiteful about people than merciful and full of grace. That we have a heart to judge, but there is no heart to love that we are just becoming a us versus them kind of church, and that's not what we're supposed to be. But you won't know that unless you're in the Word, unless it's the Word of God being fed to your soul, and the Holy Spirit is adding the nourishment to that. But if you're chasing what every Tom, Dick, Harry, and Mary out there that isn't solid in the Word of God, folks, it's not only going to twist your mind, it's going to twist your heart. It's going to twist your mind, and it's going to twist your heart. And that saddens me greatly. So, our appeal we make does not spring from air or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. There are people out there, look, some of these people don't even know that they're an heir. Some of these people, these, these, you know, these apostles and prophets and bishops and pastors, some of them have no biblical training at all. And I'm not saying that they have to go to Bible college or seminary but they've got no biblical training at all. They never learned how to handle the scripture in the first place, so they can't teach you how to handle it because they never learned how to handle it. It's all about dreams and visions and God showed me and God told me and all of these kinds of things. And they'll say, well, you know, God did that in the Old Testament or God did that in the New Testament. Sure he did, but you just can't say, well, because he did it there, he's doing it through me. Like, are you the new apostle? Are you adding to Scripture? Are you, new, are you the, new, the new prophet? Who says so? You say so? Your, 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 you know, your supper buddies, your lunchtime buddies say so? It's because you got a podcast? Again, 
Any idiot can have a podcast. I mean, really? That's, that's why? You know, you've, you've got 17,000 followers all across the country of 40 million, so that makes you somebody, right? I don't think so. Because, you know, you make it look like the Holy Spirit's flowing through you. Well, anything can be faked. I mean, like, let's, let's be really serious about this. You need to get into the Word. You need to learn to handle the Word because there are people out there that they're, they're, they're air. They've never been taught properly. They don't know how to teach properly. There are some people out there with impure motives that they're just trying to get a following. They're just trying to get a crowd. They're just trying to become popular. They're just trying to become famous. And they're trying to do it on the backs of you. So watch it. Doesn't spring from air or impure motives. And out and out, you know, the me stuff. And out and out. Some people are just trying to trick you. Look, the Bible says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, let me read this to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Again, remember, I'm trying to give you some scripture for all of this. Um, let me read this for you. What Paul says. Um, no, 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, it says this. And I will keep on doing what I'm doing, Paul says, in order to cut the ground from under those who have the opportunity to be considered equal with us about things they boast about, Right? Paul is saying there are others out there saying they're, they're, they're solid apostles. They're credible. Paul says this, For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their action deserves. Right? They're trying to trick us. There are people out there that are promoting a false gospel, a false doctrine, false teachings. They're trying to get you to hate everybody and everything that isn't in your little crowd, isn't in your little way of thinking, and all of that's not biblical. And the reason why they're doing that, they're trying to trick you, is because some of them are just false apostles and false prophets. Again, they may not even have started off that way. They may have thought, you know what, I think I had a dream, a vision, a, 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 a heart for something, but because they're so poorly trained, because there's no accountability, They've just gone off their rocker and teaching all kinds of crazy things. And then they become these false teachers and false apostles and all of that. And it's up for you and I to be able to understand the word well enough that when we hear false doctrine, we call it out. When we see and sense a false spirit, the Bible tells us in 1 John 4 and 1 to test all the spirits, we call it out. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4 that the spirit, the spirit, not the Antichrist, but the spirit of the Antichrist has been out there since the beginning, right? Since since Jesus was crucified. It, it, it's, it's out there. Before that, it's been out there, right? I mean, it's, it's out there. So we, we need to be, you need to hold yourself accountable from knowing right from wrong when it comes to biblical teaching. You have no excuse. You have to take care of yourself. I'm here trying to take care of you, but I'm, I'm only with you for a few minutes a week. You have the responsibility to take care of yourself, your spouse, your family, those kinds of things. When you hear false doctrine, false teaching, when you hear error, when you see you know, false motives, when you hear trickery, see trickery, you call it out for what it is. Quit being passive about that stuff and call it out for what it is. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. It's wrong. Be careful that you're not trying to gather around yourself people saying what your itching ears want to hear. Rather, you should be in the Word of God and make sure you study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and avoid all the godless gobbledygook that is out there. <sighs> that's my heart. That's my heart for you. That's, that's Paul's heart for the Thessalonian church. Watch out. Watch out for those. Let me read it for you once again. Verse 3, For our appeal we make does not spring from air, impure motives, or are we trying to trick you? Folks, challenge me with this. Put me to the test. <clears throat> Am I in error? Do I have false motives? Am I trying to trick you? Put me to the test through the Scriptures. I'm telling you to put other people to the test. Put me to the test too. God bless you. The Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Pray about it. Think about it. Read it. Bye for now. Pastor Brent loves you.